Okay, so I think we are going to get started. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Hilary Mazin and I am a business support partner here at The Airway Scotland. Today's session is about circular procurement and why it's better for business to develop circular business models within the supply chain. So I will start off with my first slide um, to give you a little bit of background on Zero Waste Scotland. Uh, we are a not-for-profit environmental organisation funded by the Scottish Government. Uh, we exist to lead Scotland to use products and resources responsibly, focusing on where we can have the greatest impact on climate change. And our goal is to use evidence and insight to help inform policy and motivate individuals and businesses to embrace the environmental, economic and social benefits of a circular economy. So in my next slide, I just wanted to kickstart the session by introducing the circular economy and today's main focus, which will be circular procurement. Um, our speakers will go into a lot more detail about this, um, but this is just kind of a brief overview. Um, so traditionally, we have followed a linear economy of make, use and dispose of, which, as we know, produces a vast amount of waste and in which products and materials are mainly kind of single use. They have the one life. Uh, we sort of reproduce them. We use them and then they go to landfill or they get disposed of. Um, over the past few decades, however, we've been following an economy of recycling in which we tackle the issue of waste sort of at an end of life stage. Um, we try to extract value from materials and products that we use sort of once they've reached the end of their life. Um, a circular economy, however, is one that strives to prevent waste and pollution from being created in the first place doing so through a more sort of intentional design of products, services and systems, and focusing on maximizing the lifespan of goods and materials, and sort of prioritizing um, long-term thinking over short-term consumption. Um, this image is a really great way to explain the concept of circular economy, sort of a good illustration on how in a circular economy, products and materials are kept in circulation for um, as long as possible, and they are designed from the outset to be sort of reused, repaired, remanufactured, kind of kept in circulation for as long as possible, essentially cutting out the concept of waste um, entirely. Um, a fundamental element of this system is procurement uh, and how we define and change the demand for products and services that we use. Um, circular procurement aims to actively close energy and material loops within supply chains while sort of minimizing any negative environmental impact or waste creation across their whole life cycle. And therefore this is an essential functional component of the circular economy. This is what we will be talking about in today's session. Uh, and we have a really great lineup of speakers for it, which takes me to our agenda for today. Uh, first of all, we will hear from Stephen Menzies, who is Head of Procurement and Grants at Zero Waste Scotland. Um, he will be giving us a much more in-depth and thorough introduction to the concept of circular procurement, why it's important and how we can work on uh, implementing it. We'll then hear from Jim Brannan, uh, Head of Supply Chain Development at Balfour BT. Uh, Jim manages large procurement teams across a breadth of multinational industries and he will be providing some personal experience as well as really great contextual example of how we can go about implementing the necessary change to make way for the circular economy. Um, and finally, we will hear from Brian O'Reilly, who is the founder and managing director of Egg Lighting. Um, Egg Lighting is a highly innovative business which creates sustainable lighting and sensor control systems. They employ circular strategies such as remanufacturing and product as a service. And I think this will be a really great way to end the session by demonstrating from an operational point of view how business can be done differently uh, in view of a more secular economy. We will then uh, finish with a Q&A session and aim to close by 11.30. Um, so finally, a little bit of housekeeping, uh, just on my next slide, there we go. Uh, just to kind of note uh, that everybody aside from our speakers uh, will have their cameras and microphones turned off. 
So if you do have any questions, please ask them via the chat function. Uh, I'll keep an eye on the chat and then uh, I'll kind of put these questions forward to our speakers at the end of the session. Please do ask questions. It's a really great opportunity to kind of pick our speakers' brains. It's a great topic today. I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion uh, kind of at the end of the session. Um, also to note, the webinar is being recorded, uh, so it'll become a permanent resource on the Zero Waste Scotland website um, if you wish to go back to it at a later date. Um, OK, I think that covers everything for our introduction. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass on to Stephen, who will provide us with a bit of an introductory session to um, circular procurement. Okay, thanks, Hilary. Uh, so the procurement function at Zero Waste Scotland, we look after both the operational procurement activity, but we also work with other public sector procurement teams to help them implement circular procurement projects. The next slide that we're going to bring up, I'm going to go back to the About Us slide from Zero Waste Scotland. Because I think to highlight that phrase, use products and resources responsibly, is key to this. It is the key element of circular procurement. It's possibly the bit that's maybe a little bit different to past practice. Procurement traditionally was always going out and buying new things. Sometimes not buying something is the solution. Making things last longer, not actually going and doing a procurement in the first place. Uh, design, making design changes, thinking about how you do things. We'll, we'll come into this in a bit more detail in, in a later slide. Uh, the next slide I want to bring up uh, explains a little bit about our ProCIRC project. So ProCIRC is an EU interreg funded project that's been running for the last four years. It promotes the concept of circuit procurement through the use of pilot projects and shared learning. There's 11 partner organisations across six different countries that have taken part in this and Zero Waste Scotland is part of this project. One of the key outputs of the project is to provide access and learning, as well as guidance on each of the pilot projects, and to provide a, a lasting legacy through a library of information that people can use, regardless of where they are potentially within the journey of circular procurement. So the next slide I want to put up um, is one that Hillary put up earlier, um, and just add a wee bit more context to that. The, the graphic itself comes from Circular Flanders, who are one of the, the ProCIRC partners. It's a simple, effective way to show what we're trying to achieve through um, circular procurement. It's about keeping things out of the bin for as long as possible. It doesn't really get more simple than that as an explanation of what we're trying to achieve. The methodology, how you do that, is far more complex, and we understand that, and we know that it's not a simple thing to, to achieve this fully. But the concept of how you start with it is potentially a little bit simpler. So it, it may also include designing new products and services in a way that they reduce the impact of future purchases, the making things last longer, the, the designing them for repair and reuse. And our next slide gives a slightly more detailed example of a, another circular procurement model. This alternative slide of the circular economy and the circular procurement comes from the EU Green Procurement document. It shows a little more about the stages that loop around during the life cycle of goods and services. On the left, we've got a traditional linear approach, the five boxes. They're the linear approach to procurement that probably we all understand and traditionally have all done. If you then start to think during that design and production phase about resource minimization and waste prevention, and keep that going through all the, the, the stages of, of the use of the product or service, then all of a sudden it starts to become a little bit more circular. If you then bring in the, the loops around about the repair, reuse, recycling, recovery, these make it even more circular. And following that waste hierarchy of, of thinking about re repair and reuse, first of all, before you get to think about recycling and recovery, because obviously, as much as they are important, if we can take them almost as a last resort, it is a way for us to be as circular as we possibly can. The next slide that we're going to go on to shows us um, the importance of circular procurement and where it fits in in things. Um, this slide, prepared uh, by Zero Waste Scotland, it shows that things like commuting and heating, they create a large part of our carbon footprint, but it's the goods and services that consume the massive amount of our carbon footprint. Uh, or sorry, it's the goods and services that we consume that account for a massive part of our carbon footprint. About 80% of our carbon footprint comes 
from the goods and services that we all consume, both as individuals and through our organisations as well. And circular procurement is key to helping reduce the impact of these goods and services. It does require a bit of a shift in mindset across society. This potentially could be triggered by procurement activity. Procurement activity re is responsible for a lot of spend, certainly in Scotland and, and the world over as well. Um, and by thinking about how we, we do change our activities, it can reduce our carbon footprint. It can help towards a thriving economy where we're creating new and varied job opportunities. Um, thinking about things like reuse, repair, et cetera, then we're, we're potentially creating new job opportunities and, and possibly create some competitiveness and some innovation within Scottish business as well. And that hopefully should bring more prosperity for people through an inclusive economy that benefits everybody's well-being. Our next slide um, just explains a little bit about where some of this information has came from. Um, Zero Waste Scotland have two main publications that have been produced in the last couple of years that, that give a lot more detail on this. Uh, uh, the material flow account from 2021 shows each person in Scotland uses about 18 tonnes of materials a year. A sustainable level for individuals in Scotland would be somewhere in the reach of about eight tonnes per year. So we are currently using more than twice what is sustainable in terms of resources from the planet. We've also recently published our circularity gap report, and it further highlights areas where we can look to target how we can increase, how we can be more circular. Um, these are two very, very useful documents, and they provide a lot of information and go into a lot more detail than obviously I, I'm going to go into today around about some of the numbers and why it's important to do this and the individual breakdown of some of the materials that are used and where they're used across different sectors and areas and commodities and things like that. So the next slide, once again, returns to a diagram from the EU Green Procurement document. Uh, we're talking about recycling, so I'm recycling my slides. But what I have added this time on the right-hand side is I've added three things, and, and these three things are probably key to emphasise, because yes, they are fairly simple, they're fairly straightforward, but if these are at the back of every thought process that you have around about your procurement activity, then they can only help with what you're trying to do around about becoming more circular. Reducing the amount of raw materials that are used, reduce your carbon emissions and reduce the waste that is produced through anything that you procure. It is a very simple philosophy to start with. The complex part is how you do it, how you start to think about it, how you measure it how you understand its effectiveness for you and how you get the most out of it, and then use that potentially as evidence for your own internal organisation to grow your activity or potentially for your customers or to sell this through to your suppliers as well, potentially. So the next slide gives a little bit more detail about some of the things that could form part of the how you do this. There are many different things. I'm not going to go through each of these individually. But I think the thing to highlight is that some of these are relevant to the goods and services you will supply or use. Some of them may be suited to one particular project that you're working on. Some may be good for you to do now within your current practices and processes. Some of them may be things that offer opportunities for future development or activity. They may need additional policies, procedures, processes even, and some of them may even require a little bit of investment for you to do them. But each one of these is something that you could consider as part of, if you like, a checklist as you're doing procurement activity to think about, is there an opportunity here for us to do some of these, these things as part of our procurement process? Now, some of them may be a very easy option, and it may be choosing one product over another. Some of them may be more difficult and may require input from your supply chain. It is all about thinking about what can you do in the short, medium and long term. And I think if we move on to the next slide, we can talk about that in a little bit more detail over the next couple of slides. So this type of process is probably not new to you. This is probably something you're doing almost as part of your everyday thinking. The new part is potentially applying this thinking in terms of circularity. It's about benchmarking where you are, what are driving your requirements of why you want to be circular potentially. Is it something that comes from regulatory changes? 
Is it your customer requirements? Is it a sales opportunity that's come along? Depending on where you are in the marketplace, where you are in the supply chain, there may be different things that drive what you're trying to do. Those targets can be short, medium and long term. Something that is always useful for building momentum in this is going for the quick wins. There are maybe things you can do straight away that show that you are starting to make a difference. It builds a bit of momentum in your organisation. It builds potentially interest from other staff members or other parts of your organisation. And potentially it gives you a start of a, a selling point to some of your customers. If you communicate that across the organisation well, all of a sudden your customers, your supply chain and your internal resources, staff, everything you have starts to build and starts to buy into what you're trying to do. The plan, implement, review and update is probably something you already do. It features in your planning process. The plan, do, check, act cycle is, is something that's been around for many, many years. It's something that can be relatively easily applied to thinking about circular procurement. So moving on to the next slide, it, it gives you some questions to potentially think about. Now, each organisation will have many, many questions that need to consider depending on where they fit into a specific marketplace. If, for example, they supply to public sector organisations, they may be looking for some way of building evidence that they can put in as part of a tender bid, for example. Uh, they need to think about who their customers are, what are those customers, what are they looking for, how are they looking for it? Are they looking for it as evidence? Are they looking for it in particular products or services that are provided? These questions can come from many different places. And obviously, as part of thinking about this and implementing this, bringing in others across your organisation to potentially help you think about what those questions should be can be a really good way of engaging with the rest of the organisation. It may help you fit into some of the benchmarking you do. It may help you fit into some of the set of the targets. Even the planning stages of the previous diagram, for example, all of these questions can help drive some of those thoughts and some of the activities that you need to do. The last question there, what does my organisation want to achieve? Maybe that should actually be one of the first questions that you're asking, because that is potentially one of the most important questions, is to think about where is your organisation and what do they want to do, where do they want to go, and where are they potentially just now on the, the journey of circular procurement. Moving forward, a wee bit of potential further reading for you in the next slide. Um, so the first of those is the material flow account and the circularity gap report, both on the Zero Waste Scotland website. Useful documents to, to give a little bit of context in terms of numbers. A couple of guides produced by the EU um, that are really useful reading if, if you're starting off in this process. The, the Circular Procurement in Eight Steps Guide is a, a very, very useful thing. It breaks down individual activities into different steps that take you towards circular procurement. It goes into them in a lot more detail than obviously I'm going into them today. Uh, green Public Procurement document, of which I've used the slide a couple of times, from that, another interesting, useful read that, that explains a bit about what people are trying to do, how they can go about it. And there is quite a lot of information on the Interreg ProSIP project website. The ProSIP project, as I mentioned at the very start, one of the things we're trying to do as we come to the end of that project is provide a legacy through useful documents, guidance and templates, and some evidence of pilot projects around about what we could potentially see from that. Hopefully, I've laid these out in a way that if you drop any of those phrases into a search engine, it, it should be the first thing that comes up for you. Um, they're relatively easy to find, um, and obviously, people will share this, the information to everyone who's attending today. So, the final slide, I'm just going to recycle my question mark for this one. Um, think about promoting reuse. Thank you for listening. If you have got any questions, then please drop them into the chat and then we're more than happy to take them after Jim and Brian have given their presentations as well. So thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Stephen, uh, for that. It was a really kind of really useful introduction, um, kind of a clear overview of what we mean by secular procurement and really how much of an impact can be had by kind of thinking about procurement differently.
Um, lots of great questions at the end there as well and uh, really great resources. Um, so moving on, uh, we are now going to pass on to um, Jim. Sorry, thank you very much and good morning and hello everyone. Delighted to, to be here this morning and um, I was reflecting last night on how I was going to approach uh, this webinar and rather than, than hit you with lots and lots of slides, I would like to, before I do show you some slides, which is only four, maybe give you a personal reflection on my, not so much journey, but voyage of discovery in circular economy. Before I do that, let me just give you a little bit of background to me and who I am. So, Jim Brannan, I work with Balfour Beatty. I've been 48 years now in industry. 45 of those have been in procurement and supply chain management in running big teams um, across a number of industries, electronics, engineering, software, telecoms, construction, um, to name but a few. So I've been around the block a long time and I've seen lots of um, different things in procurement in terms of strategies and how we should execute and deliver. But for me, as I came to the end of what has been a tremendous um, time in, in procurement and running teams, I realized that we need to start looking at how we procure differently. And the challenge that we've got on climate action is really one that is an existential threat to, to the planet. And, and the IPCC report that came out this week really um, emphasized that more about we need to act now. So that's all about, about background about me and, and let me get a, a bit of context about uh, my role and what I do. So as I say, up till two years ago, I was head of procurement for Balfour BT in Scotland. I also looked after Balfour BT Kilpatrick, their M&E uh, division across the whole of the UK. So it gives me a, a kind of fairly unique perspective in looking across the whole of the UK um, at uh, what is going on within industry and, and construction. Um, everyone was impacted hugely by the pandemic and, and not least of me, me being the age I was, I was, I was at a point in my career where I thought, how do I kind of look at, how do I change things for the better going forward in looking at the challenge of, of climate action? So I had a chat with Balfour Beatty and at the same time, it coincided with Balfour Beatty's uh, release of their strategy on uh, what's called building new futures about decarbonisation, uh, about net zero, and going beyond net zero, reducing waste and impacting positively our communities and where we work and where we operate. So in stepping back from that role, I took on a new role as head of supply chain development. As I say, since then, it's been not so much as, as, as a journey, but a voyage of discovery and looking at what do businesses need to do and how can we support our supply chain in a way that is positive and enables them to really start this just transition to a net zero economy. And, and as I've been on this journey over the last couple of years, I've been involved in many discussions with many different groups, both government and NGOs in looking at what the challenges are for them and how we go about addressing those challenges. And it's it's huge, let's, let's not underestimate it. And given that we are failing in that climate action in terms of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, and let's not forget that, that this is in legislation, this is in trade and legislation in the UK and in Europe about reducing our, our emissions, reducing our carbon, reducing our waste. And, and it's so important that we really kind of get a focus on that. And that then means that we have to look at how do we do things? Not can we just think around the edges of doing things a little bit different, but how do we do things completely different? Now, when we look at the models that, that was shown in the last slide, you've got lots of interesting ways that we can we can adapt into circular economy. But, but one of the, the things that really struck me over my time in doing this role is not reuse, remanufacture, repeat. It's about rethinking, really rethinking what it is that we are doing. 
and how we go about it. And I've had lots of experiences now running different workshops. And I'll, I'll talk about one of those workshops that we did for Fife College as part of this presentation and the learnings that we had from that process. But the workshops that I've been involved in come back to the same, the same old, same old, which is if we don't design it in at the start, then we get a suboptimal solution at the end. And in reflecting on lots of that or those discussions that, that we are in in those workshops, it becomes evident that people have a a drive to deliver a project at a budget at a cost, and we drive a behaviour that's really not thinking about how do we optimise the use of circular economy techniques or methodology. It's all about let's drive to the bottom line cost. It's a free bid and a buy approach, which is not in any way going to get the results that we need going forward. We need to be a more collaborative society. We need to look at how do we collectively, because it is a collective, huge collective challenge that we've got. How do we collectively address that challenge? And as I go through lots of these workshops and discussions, engagements with our supply chain, and I talk to them about what are they doing and what, what you know, how do they understand what circular means? There was a real kind of light bulb moment that, that struck me very early in the process is that no one quite knew what circularity meant. How does how do we go how do we go about introducing a circular model to our business? Literacy was a kind of key part of lots of discussions about trying to understand not just circular economy, but but you talk about green skills and you, sometimes skills when you're talking to people, their eyes go wide and they go, "Well, what's a green skill?" Um, it's it's really for me. It's been about over the last couple of years, looking at how do we bring about action into all the things that we know that we need to do to address this climate action threat. Circular economy is a key enabler to that. And as I've gone through my journey, I've, I've really embraced what it is that we need to do. We need to, we need to educate and we need to get hearts and minds. And that's hearts and minds, not just at, at you know, the employee level, but we need to get it at the board level. Board level needs to buy into, we need to address our climate action plan as, as a business and how do we adapt, adapt and bring in circular economy into our business models. So that, that's kind of been my personal journey and I continue on that journey and, and believe me, it is a journey and it is a voyage of discovery and I discovered different things. Every day is a school day is a great saying for me because every day is a school day as I find what's coming down the line, be it in policy and legislation. Um, I mentioned earlier, we, I was involved in, in the consultation on the circular economy bill with the Scottish Government. It's not yet um, had its final reading through Parliament. It will it will do this year, I believe. Um, but when I started to engage in a conversation with businesses about this, the Circular Economy Bill, I would say that 90% of them didn't even know that such a bill was being consulted on. So this, this is about education. It's about hearts and minds. It's about getting people really engaged in, in what is going on in terms of circular economy. I've got a couple of slides, just four. I'm not going to go through them in great detail, but what I'm going to just describe is a process that we went through with the Fife Super Campus, which Balfour Beatty are building on behalf of the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government had an ambition, a desire to deliver this project net zero. So in order to do that, we needed to look at our supply chain in a different way. So we engaged with Zero Waste Scotland, who supported this process of um, 
engaging with our supply chain. We engage with a third party called Insight Futures uh, to help us develop a workshop that allowed us to take a big slice of our supply chain, go out to them, and we ask them a series of questions to do with climate action and what they were doing in terms of their own climate action plan. Now, there's a framework. Uh, you can see it's circular there. I won't go through all the narrative. You'll get copies of these slides and you can read them at your own um, when, when you want. Um, but at the centre of that, you'll see there's climate action. And within the climate action at the centre, there's digital data, decarbonisation and circular economy as the key enablers for change. Um, if you move on to the next slide, um, so what's, what is the methodology and what does Circle represent? So Circle was a platform that we used on these 280 questions that we asked our supply chain to complete. And the Circle, you'll see as, a, as an acronym, uh, as the very top climate action your company it has or has developing some key characteristics in climate action. It's supported by strategic uh, directive capability, the approach to manage climate action innovation, and their significant focus on climate-based competition. So what do we need in order for that to be present? There needs to be commitment. So the level of commitment um, at the board level, there has to be insight into looking at trends analysis and opportunities in your current business model. And that includes looking at how do we implement circular economy techniques. You, you need resilience in your current business model. You need readiness. Um, and it needs to be that your, your business is in a constant state of change and innovation. You need to be ready to explore new products and services, business models. And the next speaker will talk about new business models. Um, and you need to value those um, ensuring relevance to your customer and market position. Collaboration, this is really key. Collaboration needs to be at the heart of what we're doing. I mentioned earlier that, that collectively we need to look at how do we um, meet this grand challenge of climate action. We need to collaborate in a much, much better way, right at the start of the process, right at the design, and rethink how we do things. We need leadership. We do need, we need leadership right at the top that's going to drive these changes. And then we need to execute. Just as IPCC said at the start of the week, we need to act now. I've been in too many forums, too many great, Great sessions, but there's lots of talking and little action. We need action. And we need to identify what those barriers are to action, and we need to remove them where we can and get those uh, enablers enacted. Um, next slide. So after we did all that and looked at it, and there was a process that we went through, and we looked at all the returns of, of on the platform, and then we identified where each of our supply chain, next slide, where each of our supply chain fell within the climate action uh, triangle. So there was a stage that you went through, so stage one, stage to stage five. Um, unfortunately, we went to stage two, and you weren't doing anything, then you uh, basically were at terminal stage. But if you passed stage two, you went to stage three, four, and five, and then there's a triangle there at the bottom that identifies exactly where you are in terms of your climate action and circular approach to your business. So you're either climate action impaired, you've got some local, local climate action plans. At stage three, you've got climate action aspirations, which include, or could include circular business models being implemented. You are definitely at stage four, a climate action organization. And at, at stage five, you are definitely a competitor in climate action and you're doing all the right things at the right time. So that was the kind of methodology we went through. We, we identified, here's our supply chain that we're going to engage for this net zero project. We're going to ask them, where is your starting point? Where are you right now? Then we gave them a roadmap of, here's where you are, having answered all those questions, and here's what you need to do to get to where you need to be. If, 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 you, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there, and you'll go too, down too many rabbit holes. The intent of this was to point them in the direction where they need to go to understand what they need to do quickly to start their journey on looking at a more sustainable uh, version of themselves, including the circular economy, and looking at how they could get involved in the circular economy methodology. 
that's an ongoing process. And from that, the, that we, we, we then run a workshop. The workshop identified the number of ideas that came out from a collaboration that we had. Those ideas have, have gone into, some of them have gone into um, the academic world and we're working with some academia in looking at some, some solutions for the college in terms of the way that, that we will deliver uh, certain aspects of it. Uh, and I've been in follow-up workshops on that. So we are, we are really getting real engagement through that kind of redesign and rethinking. Uh, and uh, it's it's been a, as I said at the start, it's been a journey for me personally. It's been a revelation. It's been um, it's it's been really interesting to find out where we are as 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 a as a business personally, but as our supply chain and the help and support that we can bring to them. Using Zero Waste Scotland has been great because they've really been advocates of this and they've helped us along that, that, that particular journey um, and continue to do so. So um, that really is everything that I wanted to say. I think I've run a little bit over, so my apologies. Um, so, Hilary, back to you. That's great. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, it's a really inspiring story. Um, and also kind of a great example on how circular procurement can be kind of practically implemented in a real life context. I think a great takeaway from this is how kind of taking a step back, kind of questioning how we do things to start with is really important. And also, you know, addressing the questions of commitment, community, behavior as kind of drivers for the real change. Um, and that is actually a great way to introduce our final speaker, uh, Brian um, from Egg Lighting. So, Great, let's um, move forward with Brian. Hi everyone, um, thank you for the, the opportunity to present here today. Um, okay, I'll start with um, egg lighting. Um, our vision is to make um, lighting solutions that last. Um, we want this to happen um, with um, technological progress. Um, that balance between making things last and innovation and constant change of technology, we hope to marry together um, in our lighting systems. Um, next slide, please. Okay, it's important for us to, um, within lighting, to get the right language. So we talk about embodied and operational carbon. So historically within the lighting industry, um, there's been a preoccupation with operational carbon. So this translates very easily into reducing your electricity bills. Um, you know, the, 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 the better the operational carbon, um, the more efficient the light system and the lower your energy bills. Now the light bulb moment for me um, within lighting was, um, you know, I, if you can excuse the pun, um, we had installed a new lighting system. I was very happy with the, the business um, and because we felt that we were doing good. We were lowering other businesses' carbon footprints and their operational carbon. And then as I was um, approaching um, a, a project, um, I noticed the skip outside. And I went and had a look at that skip. And I could see in that skip lots of perfectly functional lights um, that were um, older technology um, with fluorescence and sawns and metal halides in that skip. And that skip for me was the flying ointment because I thought, what a waste. There's so much energy has went into to create these products. Um, there's nothing wrong with them, but there they are. They've been skipped. Um, so that was rather concerning for me and I decided to scratch the surface of it and go a little bit deeper. And um, what I found was that LEDs, the technology within LEDs is improving at a rather fast rate governed by something called Hate's Law. And when we looked at this and put it into our, our ROI documents, we could see that there was a financial case to replace lighting systems every four or five years. And furthermore, we found that LEDs at that point in time were hermetically sealed, i.e. These, these things were just um, designed to be disposed of hook, line and sinker. There was no repair in these units. Um, so that, that kind of um, was 
disturbing, I suppose, would be the right term to use um, to me because I had got involved in, in LED lighting because I thought I was doing the right thing for the planet. Um, but lo and behold, we were in a cycle of um, waste generation, um, which was, you know, um, disturbing. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to go into some of the things that we learned from a, a procurement point of view. Um, now, Steve, Stephen had some of this in his slides. Um, I think it was the, um, the strategy for circular procurement. There was a lot of good information in that. I'd ask you to go back to that slide. I'm going to touch on some of it here that we kind of picked up on and um, share with you maybe some, some tips. Um, I think the first thing that everybody thinks of and we can all identify with in sustainable procure, uh, procurement is repair and remanufacture and recondition. That's obvious, let's, let's fix it um, if it's broken and keep it in use for as long as possible. Um, within the lighting industry, um, a certain level of expertise is needed. So um, it's a key consideration there. Um, also on Stephen's slide, he mentioned, I think the word modular appeared quite a few times. There's a couple of considerations there uh, if you're involved in procurement. It's um, vendor lock-in. Um, so in the lighting industry, we found that um, although we had, we had procured modular LED lights, we were tied to certain manufacturers. And um, that was really challenging for us because um, those, at, at that point in time, we were importing from, from China and um, getting them, they wanted to sell more lights. They didn't want to sell parts for you to fix things. Um, so you, you need to ensure that, that you, there's no vendor lock-in. Um, another thing that we came off, it, it came, came across closer to home was where we could see other companies were going down this modular route. Um, was that they had adopted um, a razor blade business model. I think they call it, that sounds a bit sinister, but it's also called the printer business model, whereas the cost of the component changes is so high that it's approaching the cost of a new item so that you're almost dissuaded from repairing it because of, of the cost of the, the, the components that are out there. Um, the printer model is, 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 is referred to because um, for a period, printers were, were sold cheap and the cartridges were sold high. Um, component availability is another, I, I touched on that with the vendor lock-in, but from a procurement point of view, you want to make sure that there's a variety of sources where you can, you can source components. Um, standards, this will I'll kind of chap on this one um, a couple of times throughout the throughout the um, presentation. And um, it's important that um, standards are, are, are adopted when you're, you're, you're doing these types of repair. Um, we take on legal responsibility for um, repairing and remanufacturing luminaires. And um, that, that's important that we follow standards when doing that. Now, within the circular economy, it may not, may not be obvious what standards um, apply, um, but you can, you can draw parallels from other industries. We often look to the construction industry um, as their carbon footprint is enormous. Um, there's a lot more energy in the construction industry um, given to understanding how to reduce carbon footprints. So we often refer to, to SIPSI standards. Standards are also really important because they give your customer confidence um, that the quality is, is, is being maintained. You know, when they've bought the product, it's been UKCA marked and um, they don't want any loss in the, the, the safety elements of it or the, the kind of the, the quality of the item. Um, another key topic, which is quite challenging within the circular economy, is going to be metrics. How do we, um, how do we determine that, that one solution is better um, than another, one circular solution is better than another? So I think carbon footprint is, is the key measure there. Um, and you if, you, if you're involved in supplying customers, you're going to ask yourself, 
um, how do I quantify the carbon footprint of what I'm doing, my service or, or product? Um, there are calculators out there, um, and I would ask, you know, or I would suggest that you go and check TM65, which is a, a kind of SIPSI guideline just to start. It might not be the right tool for you. Um, it was for us. It was a bit crude. Um, the standards are catching up with the, the circular economy idea and concept. Um, we are lucky in the lighting industry and um, the standards are a little bit more mature and, and we've been lucky also in that we've been able to participate in the, the forming of, of, of some of those standards for um, circular economy within the lighting industry. Next slide, please. Okay, so one of the things that we do is remanufacturing. Why do we remanufacture? Um, or in terms of speaking to your customers, we, re, we you know we remanufacture because it's, it's lower cost um, um, than an equivalent new. Um, generally, that ends up being about twenty or thirty percent lower cost within rear manufacturing, and that makes sense. If I'm replacing a driver, it shouldn't cost as much as a whole new unit. If I'm replacing the LED, it shouldn't cost as much as a whole new unit. Um, it's important to say in remanufacturing um, that it returns the product to new condition or um, better than new. So we can often get the latest components that are on the market, i.e. Um, LEDs, which are um, the most efficient in the market, which you may not be able to get in a product yet because um, product lines take a wee bit of time to catch up with the, with the technology. So remanufacturing can genuinely be better than, than, than a new product um, in terms of efficiency. Um, remanufacturing works not in every instance, um, but where it does work is where you have medium to kind of high quality luminaires um, and you've got medium to high volumes involved in it. Because there's a lot of paperwork, as you can imagine, with regards to the standards and, and documenting um, the, the process that you went through. Um, how circular is remanufacturing? Well, this is, is a circular economy assessment method um, within Lighten, um, and this is the, the document that, that I'm proud to say we contributed to as a business, um, TM66. Re, the, the kind of the score goes from zero to four, and I would say generally the remanufacturing um, scores a one or a two. So it's not the most circular. Um, thing that you can do. There's been references to design, and I'll cover that in the next slide. Um, and some of the, the other presenters touched on that as well. That certainly scores higher than, than re remanufacturing. I, and when I, I would say, just as a general point, when you're comparing, um, you know, Jim spoke about um, the, the assessment of their supply chain. Um, when I, Thing, one thing I would encourage those in procurement to do is look out for innovation. Don't stifle innovation. You know, they may it may be that they've, they've not quite met the letter of whatever assessment method that you've come up with, but you know, we're, we're, we're looking to innovation to, to give us answers here. And it doesn't, and as I said, the standards are, are catching up with the concept of circular economy. Sometimes standards can be a wee bit behind, or sometimes the assessment methods that you've um, you, you, you created, um, the, 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 yeah, you need to make sure that they are they're flexible. Um, another important point for remanufacturing is warranties. Um, when your your customers are, you know, they're embarking um, on a new territory, and you can understand that there may be some trepidation there, and um, nothing nothing says you know, confidence in what you're doing and your products than, than, a, than a warranty. And that warranty should be equivalent to a new warranty, if not better. Um, but within the remanufacturing process, you know, you're, you're stripping it down, you get a real feel for the product and uh, your confidence, you know, is, is communicated to your customer through, through the warranty. Um, it's important in remanufacturing to see that partnerships are key 
you know, um, Jim spoke about supply chain. Um, we've obviously got our supply chain too. Our focus is trying to make everything as local as possible within our supply chain, because that's that's a, a key element of circularity. We don't want to be shipping things from um, thousands of miles away. Um, if we can avoid it, in some cases it's unavoidable, but um, we, we definitely do try to, to avoid it. Um, I've listed a few there. You know, we've got waste handlers. Universities are, are key. We're in new territory again. We need some of the best minds that we can get a hold of to um, to, to help us on, on this journey. Um, and we also um, are quite open. Um, we realise that no man is an island. So we speak to other, lots of other light businesses and exchange kind of ways, ways of doing things and sharing information and, and knowledge. Um, so, so partnerships are key within remanufacturing. Um, I start. I kind of started this slide by saying that remanufacturing it doesn't suit in in the in many cases. Um, it doesn't some, um, but um, designed for remanufacture is is important. Um, next slide, please. So design for remanufacture is um, is better. In, in many cases, um, it scores higher in a circular score. Um, why design for remanufacture? It's important. Um, cost, if I can refer to Jim's um, presentation again, it, it mentioned cost at the start and the, the, the constraints and the pressures that we've got under cost. I think it's important to see when we're looking at design for remanufactured products that it's a lower cost over time. So that, that's the key thing here. It might cost you a little bit more to begin with um, because of the, you know, the, 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 the design element that's involved in it. But over time, that should, should absolutely cost you less. Um, it's certainly within light and um, that, that is the case. Um, I've mentioned before remanufacturing has its, its limitations, but design for remanufacture, um, you've got a carte blanche. So you can design it with upgrading and future proofing it um, in mind from the outset. And it just makes things so much easier. Within remanufacturing, we're dealing with um, all sorts of odds and sods and it can become very complicated and quite costly and, and the commercials just blow up. Um, but with design for remanufacture, you're, 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 you're future proofing it, you're protecting it for, um, for, for future use. Um, so that's, that's kind of further emphasized by how circular is design, is circular, um, how circular is designed for remanufacturing. So that would, in our assessment method that we use, that would score a three or a four, which is the top end of, of, of circular um, within, within lighting. Um, again, um, in these designs, we need to future-proof them. Um, digital records of what has been done to that product, what its supply chain looks like, where, where you can get replacement parts. All of that really needs to travel with the product. Part of the problem that I first saw in that skip um, the outside of our, our customer's warehouse was that, where do you start? You know, like just looking at it, you're like, I don't know what this is made up of. <laughs> Where does it go? Could I fix anything? Could I put LED into it? You know, just that the, there was no record, even when we went online with the model numbers, nothing. It was a, it was a discontinued product and trying to find manuals was, was very difficult in terms of just a spec and um, never mind what it was, it was how, how the product was constituted. So a dig digital passport becomes a, a, a critical part of it and is a key innovation within um, design for remanufacturing. We also put Bluetooth controls into them to kind of future proof them. Um, and we're very interested in IoT. I've said that we are trying to achieve a, a kind of a harmonious union between sustainable technology and uh, products that last. Um, so that's, that's an important part of our, our um, um, mission. Um, um, next slide, please. Okay, this, this business models um, as a service, 
um, we are well placed as the manufacturer, remanufacturer to look at after this product. Our customer isn't particularly interested in looking after it. They just want light um, and uh, that, that's it. They want quality light. Um, so that opens up new ways of doing things and new business models. We need to um, keep records of that product. We can um, offer that as a service. The maintenance of those light fittings, keeping them lasting longer and longer um, is, is, is our job, not a customer's job. They, as I said, they just want light. Um, and it also keeps the value in the product. That's another good way to look at it. So it brings in different ways of financing. Um, the, the, you know, capital purchases, which you can consider in service models, um, and it moves the, 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 the focus onto the company to make it, make it last longer. No longer is the company trying to sell you a new product tomorrow and uh, trying to, you know, displace the, the, the older product. With the company, us as the, the remanufacturer, manufacturer is very focused on um, making it last, that becomes part of our business model and that's how we make money. Um, in addition, being um, in a service model, you've got much more contact with your customer. You've got, you end up with a better relationship. They can see that you're, you've got aligned interests of making that product last. And by doing that, there's, there's a cost benefit to, to the customer. You know, we can deliver the, the, the service uh, you know, a better and better value service over time. So what your customer wants and what you want as a business is, is better aligned. Um, next slide. Sorry, I'm going to rush a little bit because I'm, I'm slightly over time here. And um, this is it's nice, always nice to finish off with a case study. And um, this was a great case study for us um, where we um, we supplied and um, designed for remanufacture luminaires for a, a sports centre in Edinburgh Leisure, Ainsley Park. And um, we took away the old light fittings and we, 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 we offered this as an additional service. We said we can remanufacture these um, and it will be significantly significantly less cost than, than new product. So we did that. They were very happy with it and we put them into another another sports centre. And as you can see, we got a, a, a glowing review from Fiona um, Harvey there at the at, at Edinburgh Leisure um, with regards to that. And we provided all the documentation with the, the carbon savings per unit, um, which they could then take forward and, um, and, and publish and hold as part of their records about you know, um, carbon footprint. Um, thank you very much for listening. It's, it's, it's been a pleasure um, presenting. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, again, a really great way to end the session. Um, and again, a reminder about how taking a step back is key and business can be done differently. And so we have to find different ways of thinking about it. Um, awesome. Thanks, everybody, for your fantastic presentations. Uh, we do have time now for our Q&A. Um, so there are some questions in the chat. Uh, the first of which is more kind of a comment um, from Stuart. Um, so what he's what he said is that circular economy is a great concept, but the practical reality of some of this doesn't tend to be discussed. And so he's given an example, which is uh, in construction, for example, the outcomes last far longer than the build and while the contract is engaged. And sort of how do we address issues such as warranties, the cost, given squeeze on budgets, insurance, uh, kind of old versus the comfort of new, um, and kind of what happens if a solution isn't at all promised to be uh, 10 or 20 years later. Um, I was thinking, Jim, do you want to um, talk about this? Would you like to respond to this comment? Yes, I can. Um, I think. It's a great comment. I mean, um, when when I'm in lots of discussions in construction about cost of ownership, and that that really is important because you have this. I talked about hearts and minds and behaviours, and I think Stephen might comment on on behaviours because he and I had a little discussion about this yesterday. You've got policy and legislation that can help guide and and, and will enable a lot of what we're trying to do and bring about change. But we need to get people to think 
in a different way that says, it's not the here and now that I'm just looking and purchasing for. It's for the long term. Now, the long term for an individual might be, well, actually, I'm only looking at this project that I'm working on for this, this period of time. Beyond that, I'm not involved in that project. I might not even be working with this company. I might be somewhere completely different. We need to stop thinking in that short-termism way, and we need to look at what is the right optimum solution for this, whatever it may be that we're building, we're constructing, certainly in the construction industry, that, that can this be repurposed for another use after its life? Can it be remanufactured, as, as Brian has alluded to? Is there a way that, that we can start thinking about that cost of ownership in a different way and not just racing to the lowest cost at the start of the project, which will give you a fit for purpose today, but not necessarily future-proofing it for the future? And future-proofing it, I mean future-proofing it from being a wasteful resource. That resource needs to be thought about. How can it be used at the end of its life? But we need to start thinking in a different way. And, and, and for me, that's the, that's the conversation that, that we need to be having is it's, it's not the here and now, it's the future. And it is a challenging conversation. I'm not pretending otherwise, but we need to start thinking in those terms. I think, uh, uh, Brian, I think yeah. Brian has a comment on that. Right, right. Or just jump in and add to, to what um, Jim said there. Um, if I've understood the question properly with regards to the, the warranty aspect of it, um, our starting point as a company is that we're not going to be around in 10 years' time um, and we're preparing that product to be handed over to somebody else. That's where the, the kind of the digital passport becomes important and where I kind of made my reference to looking in the skip and having no real information about what I had in front of me. Um, but we need to consider products as, as kind of material banks for the future. Um, and we should have um, information about the, the materials that have been used in it. So, you know, with a digital passport, you should have the repair manual. You should know where all the components come from. Those components should be widely available. So um, that, uh, that, that kind of assumption, that, that viewpoint of we're not going to be around, this isn't always good. You know, for businesses, that's difficult because they want to kind of hold on to it forever because it's a kind of, it can, can help their help their um, turnover. Um, but, you know, that, that's a rather short-sighted point of view. Um, so we're, we, you know, in terms of we're encouraging people in procurement, et cetera, to take a longer term point of view, we've done that as well. And we, our starting point is assume we don't exist in the future, but this product still needs to be looked after. That's great. Thanks for your comments, Brian. Also really interesting. Well, I think um, we could also put the question forward to Stephen maybe and kind of change the context to the kind of four or five year contract length within the public sector. Kind of how do we address this conversation within that context? Yeah, I, I think the, the two are, are definitely interlinked. Um, I, I think Stuart's point is a very valid one that he raised uh, around about that. You know, how do you through the, the life expectancy of any product or service, make sure that it's living up to its expectations. And I think the same goes for both the, the circularity aspects as it does for the quality aspect and the, the overall value for money, the repairability, all of those kind of things. I think they all come into that, that as procurement people, we need to think about how do, how do we build that into the con contract in a way that we get those assurances and we take account of them in the evaluation which is, it's not an easy thing to do, but I think the, the circularity element falls very much in the same bracket as, as the quality, the, the other assurances, the, the safety aspects, the risk, all of that type of thing, and it builds on what Brian and Jim were saying. I think contract length potentially is something else that, that then can help with that. Um, you know, Brian talked there in his presentation a lot about the, the changes and the innovation, the design, the, the investment, if you like, in both the the cost element of, of having to invest in that new way of working, but also the, the resources, the time, the effort that's involved in that. And I think 
if you can look where there is a particularly circular aspect to the contract, then if possible, I think making that contract longer to then get a better return on investment for both the supplier and from a selfish point of view, the procurement person as well. If you're going out and doing a contract every you know, three, four, five years, if you're adding lots more things in around about community wealth building, circularity, sustainability, quality, there's lots more effort involved in the writing and specification for that, the creation of the questions, the evaluation, and the suppliers having to then go and put time and effort into delivering that as well. And I think for all involved, if you can then build that relationship over a longer period of time, it's good for everyone involved because it gets a potential to get a better return on investment from everybody. And that investment can be the time of the procurement people as well as the investment of the, the resources and, and the cost of, of the supplier supplying that. And I think, um, you know, given that little bit more certainty also potentially opens the door for a bit more innovation as well, because if someone knows they're potentially getting 10 years to do something, there's more chance to actually deliver on the circularity through that 10 years. It potentially also makes it slightly easier to monitor and measure and put the contract management in place for that as well. That's great. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. I think um, kind of a system change, the way that we see things needs to change. And it all kind of circles back to what kind of everybody has spoken about uh, during this whole webinar. Um, but kind of going into a little bit more of the specifics, I have a question um, for Jim in terms of remanufactured materials. So the question is, how advanced is the market for remanufactured materials for infrastructure projects? And do you have any examples uh, that Balfour BT has delivered using remanufactured material? Um, I think it's still pretty much um, in its infancy, if I'm honest, but there are some obvious ones that we do uh, use. So recircular aggregates, for example, is, is something that we do um, from um, in, in all our projects. Um, glass. Uh, we, we, we recirculate and, and remanufacture, but it goes through a crushed um, glass process. Uh, an interesting one in terms of uh, not, not necessarily remanufactured, but again, recycling, um, use of um, recycled plastics. And uh, we um, in, in, enjoyed a, a real uh, kind of breakthrough with a company, a local company called McGruber in, in Scotland, who extract the polymer from plastics, uh, recycled plastics. And uh, we use that polymer in, in our bitumen, so we, we actually use that in the project in Edinburgh on the cycle routes in terms of the pathways. So that was an interesting one. Um, we're looking at remanufacture of, of lighting, as Brian said, in terms of looking at that at the moment. And that, that's got real potential and uh, service citation particularly uh, as well with, with the lighting. Um, we've got um, carpet tiles, which we're working with a company called uh, Shell Contracts in terms of remanufacture of reuse of carpet carpet tiles in, in um, developments and uh, there, there's, there's lots I've got a whole list of stuff that we're looking at at the moment but in terms of going back to the is the market ready not yet because there has to be a pool to create the market and that's the bit the demand bit that we need to get rethinking and I think that that, that what we'll what we will see is policy and legislation coming down the line that will demand that it's part of the whole planning process in terms of circular content. And once we start to see that, you'll start to see these, um, re, you know, the, this new green economy starting to kind of take real hold and, and we'll start to see that those businesses develop in a way that that, that they need to and, and we, we will we'll need to support and government will support and businesses will support. So, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a bit of a chicken and egg at the moment in terms of, you know, that demand needs to be created in terms of pool to, to create. But we've got we've got lots of green shoots that we're working on in terms of, of at the moment, in terms of remanufacturing. And, and, and steel is an obvious one as well. I mean, we're, we're reusing steel in, in a number of areas, uh, particularly steel coming from uh, North Sea, uh, where, where there have been, um, you know, um, rigs are being... Are being destructed and and we're using the steel from so yeah, there's there's lots of good examples that that, that we are currently um, involved in uh, in terms of remanufacture. 
Uh, but but circular economy, we need to start thinking. It's not just about remanufacture or reuse. It's about rethinking and redesigning and, and designing for a lifetime of purpose. Um, as Brian said, you know, thinking about material as a material bank for the future. But also, you know, we've really got to start thinking: Do we need this? And one of the one of the projects that we're we're, we're working on at the moment is is we're looking at packaging in a different way and how we how can we eliminate the packing that we use to bring to site and can we do it in a different way and i'm involved with uh, academia at the moment uh cardiff university looking at an alternate for bringing certain components in a reusable uh digitized packing which can be returned and, and reused um you know for as long as we need it to uh, other than using cardboard and paper and, and plastic so listen the, the, you, you just need to have a different mindset and you just need to rethink do we need this? Could we do it in a different way? How could we do it? And I think you come up with a, you know, you will come up with a, an alternative which which will fit into that circular economy um, basket in terms of yeah, that's that's great. We've done that. So that's maybe a long answer for a short question. I don't know. Uh, no, that was great, Jim. Thank you so much. And on the back of that, I'm just going to put a comment forward uh, from Glenn saying thank you, Brian and Jim, for a refreshing attitude on this subject from the construction sector. I think that's really well relevant to this webinar. We've we've spoken about this before. Uh, it, it does feel like a completely different kind of viewpoint. Uh, well, on just, that. Just, just on that, we're, we're doing a case study with uh, Zero Waste Scotland on the project we did for um, the college, and, and that, that will be published at some point in the not too distant future. So that will be on the, the Zero Waste Scotland website. So you can you can look at you know a lot of the learnings that we we got from that, and, and hopefully you'll find it interesting and and. You don't repeat the same mistakes as we did because we'll, we'll share it what's and all in terms of the learnings, and that's what it's all about. As I said earlier, it's not just about a voyage, it's, it, it, it's at our journey, it's about a voyage of discovery, discovering what works, what doesn't work. How do you engage people in a way? How do you get hearts and minds? It's um, it's really for me, the last couple of years has been it's been a, an energizer uh, as I, I see this threat as a real threat that we for uh, you know, not just now, but my children, my children's children kind of thing. So, yeah, that's what's got me motivated to get out of bed every morning and and now do this job full time, albeit two days a week, um, but focused on it entirely. Yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you, Jim. I think kind of forward looking and long long term thinking is key to this whole conversation. Um, and actually on the back of that, uh, it's a great way into the next question I have for um, uh, Brian. Uh, so with regards to the, the um, digital passport concept, sorry, for items, components and manuals, uh, the question is, how can we ensure that the resource remains available beyond the current provider and remains free or low cost uh, for future users? Um, that's, that's a really good question. Um, sorry to keep coming back to my looking at this skip full of waste scenario. Um, but when I was looking at that skip and I keep revisiting it in, in my mind, um, I realised that <clears throat> the informa information needed to be easily accessible on the product. Um, and there's, there's kind of lots of low cost ways to do that. Just now you've got like RFID, you've got NFC kind of stickers that can go onto products and give you digital information about it. Um, QR codes could even be stuck on it, but that the QR code would take you to a website which may or may not be available in the future. Um, the way we are proposing to do it, um, and we, we, we've got prototypes of this, is through Bluetooth um, tags. They kind of strike the balance for us between accessibility and low cost Bluetooth tags cost about five dollars and um, but the a key benefit they have is that they're access, accessible via mobile phones which everybody has so you can effectively um you know take your phone to the product and you should get all of this information um, in the future so that makes it um, accessible for everyone and, and low cost that's great brian thank you so much um I have another question for Jim. How would you recommend streamlining the process of switching to circular procurement practices when organization policy change can be so slow and when there are concerns about intimidating our supply chain? Intimidating our supply chain, that's an interesting mm -hmm. one. Um, we should never be intimidating anyone. It's, 
it's not the way that business should operate. Um, you know, that, that, that. How do we get streamlining? I think it goes back to my point where organization, whatever organization that you are working for, needs to be committed to what we've been talking about today, about the need for change, to embrace change. If they don't, then they will not survive. That organization just will not become sustainable because policy and legislation is coming. It is in, in discussion at the moment. And that, that, that will force change into organizations. Now, when you start to force change, then you get kickback. Um, but ultimately, what organizations need to do is embrace what needs to be done. They need to accept that doing what they've always done is not going to give them a sustainable business. Intimidating a supply chain or a supply chain being intimidated isn't going to give them a, a sustainable business because that supply chain will look elsewhere um, to organizations that are embracing the change that's coming and needed. So I think that they will become the dinosaurs and they will become extinct, those organizations. So really you need to um, get the, the uh, organization to, to really accept they need to change. And if they don't, then you're in the wrong organization. I suggest that you probably look somewhere else. Um, that, 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 I honestly believe that. Um, if, if you are in an organization that's not embracing this and sees this as a threat to their business, then that business will not sustain itself because policy and legislation ultimately will overtake them. Thank you so much, Jim, um, for that answer. I wanted to put forward a kind of a question to the three of you, really. Um, and what would be sort of some key advice? I'm thinking now about kind of takeaways from this webinar for everybody who's who's joined us and who's still watching right now. Um, what would be some key advice for sort of procurement teams looking to begin the journey? Where do they start looking? Where, how do they start? I think if I can kick off on this one, just following on from what Jim said there, I think being open with what you're trying to achieve as an organisation, even if that is at the point where you're only starting and you've only got small ambitions for the next few months, be open with your supply chain, be open to, to understand what you're trying to achieve. Um, I know it's easier said than done sometimes, especially in the public sector, but the last thing you want to do is be secretive about what you're trying to achieve because then your supply chain is having to guess what you're trying to do and build on that momentum from the start because as you start to make small changes and see small successes, we open the door to many people, especially with senior management, because if they start to see things that are a benefit to them, then they will want more of it. So I, I think that for me is it'd be open with everyone across both your organization and your supply chain about what you're trying to do. Because in many cases, the supply chain can help you do it better than you can do it in your, in your own. I, I would just like to kind of add to what Stephen's saying. I think lots of organizations just don't really know where to start because they think that any change is going to cost me. And it's not it, the, that thinking that, that it's going to cost me um, to change is, is, is short termism. There is support out there and there's lots of organizations such as Zero Waste Scotland. There is the supply chain and construction. We have the supply chain su sustainability school, which has lots of um, really free uh, point of use resource that allows you to start that journey and to become more and better educated on what needs to happen and what needs to be done. Um, there are, um, there's funding out there, um, which again, you can, you can look to Zero Waste Scotland to help provide some support on where you might get that funding. There's funding in the construction industry from the likes of the CITB. There's, um, there's innovation funds that exist both at UK government level and the um, Scotland, uh, government level and again when you start to dig in you'll start to find pathways and how you can access these 
um, organisations to at least begin the conversation on if I would like to, you know, decarbonise in manufacturing, for example, there's, um, with the Scottish government, there's, there's a huge fund available uh, and applications are open until May, I think it's May 2025. Um, there is endless support out there. You just need to go and look for it. But what you need to do is get your organisation to really get committed to doing that, to go like, okay, let me start the journey. Let me go and have a look. I get it. Yeah, there's organisations that can help and support me. Start with Zero Waste Scotland. They can point you in the direction of where you need to go. Supply Chain Sustainability School and Construction, brilliant resource, free at point of use, lots of learning tools, lots of free um, webinars, and lots of just online um, learning uh, tools that you can use and, and deploy in your own business uh, from things like um, Scope 1, 2, 3 emissions and, and how you get involved in, in uh, downloading a tool to start even measuring what, what is your Scope 1, 2, 3. There's just lots of stuff out there. And I didn't know it existed until I started going looking for it. And that was kind of my voyage of discovery, if you like. And I just found loads of stuff and been able to support our supply chain and also uh, our own business in terms of, you know, starting to make these these real uh, significant kind of, albeit small changes to start with, but making big changes now. So uh, hopefully that helps. It definitely does. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, do you have any comments on that question, Brian? Um, yeah, um, I, I think a starting point for us is that we assume that every, you know, people, consciousness of the, the environmental catastrophe or impending, you know, um, world well, we've got opportunity towards it all. Um, but every, everybody has awareness of it now. So I find that when we're speaking to procurement people there, they're, um, they're, they're, they're on your side, really. So what, what Stephen said about openness and what Jim and his presentation said about hearts and minds, that, that is really important. Um, I think procurement also understand that you, you are on a journey. So um, just be open and honest about where you are and, and your, the, 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 your direction of travel and what you're trying to achieve. Um, to add to that, um, probably... We need to take cost head on, I think, in procurement. Um, don't be afraid of that. You know, once you kind of say, right, this is what we're trying to achieve, then you jump straight into the cost issue because that's within procurement, that's the, that's the elephant in the room, isn't it? Um, and further to that, I'll just say, don't give up. This is the good fight, really. So don't don't be put off. You know, if you, when you hit one blocker, you know, just, just keep going. I've learned um, kind of, what I've learned by running into a lot of walls first. That's great. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, and kind of on the back of that, and I think sort of time for maybe one last question. Um, how do we start when we look to get sort of board level buy-in for procurement? Because obviously we've talked about, you know, advice for procurement teams, but in terms of then that kind of higher level interest, how do we go about getting started on that, triggering that. How do you get the boardroom started? Uh, board level buy-in. So how do we get kind of the higher levels, you know, CEOs interested? Um, if they're not, they should be interested. This, this, this from, a, um, you know, going back to circular economy and, and, and the challenges that, circularity brings, it's about how do we become more sustainable as a business? The CEO of any business has to have a sustainability strategy. It needs to be at their core. It has to be. I, I would be, if why don't you challenge it and go back and say, do we have a sustainable strategy? And if the answer is no, then the question should be back to them. Well, I think we need one because if we don't, then how are we going to make sure that we're still here in three, five, ten years' time? Every organisation needs a sustainable strategy. There has to be one at its core. It's just as simple as that. So go back and challenge your CEO. Go back and challenge the, the, the boardroom. Ask them, if we've not got one, can we get one? Can we, you know, there's lots of organisations that come in and even help um, to, to actually you know, break one up for you. At not a huge cost and tell you what you need to do and how you need to go about it. So, yeah, I think, again, it's back to that hearts and minds 
you have to have a passion, not just a passion for it. It, it will become a legal responsibility in terms of reporting um, that you have to have a sustainable strategy. So go ask the question. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, okay, maybe we have time for an extra, just one more. Uh, I have one more <laughs> ready. Um, I think maybe, I think we could direct this one to Stephen. Uh, you've not had a chance to speak much in our Q&A. Um, so what do you think in terms of resources uh, that could help with kind of working out how to record and measure positive impacts of using circular services and products? What's available? How can we kind of, yeah, measure and record so that then, you know, we can take it to board board level and inspire yeah. change? I think that there's a lot of, of things out there. Um, I, and I think we, we go from the, the basic recording and monitoring of, of what impacts you're having right the way through to the, the granular detail of, you know, numbers um, of, of tons or kilograms of CO2 that's been taken out of, of the supply chain, et cetera, and stuff. And I think building that in a way that makes sense to your organisation and understanding that and, and having different levels that people can report at. I, I think there's huge amounts in, in um, Jim touched on the, you know, some of the resources that are available, um, certainly in construction, there's quite a lot of research and a lot of things there about how you can monitor uh, elements and, and how you can report on it. And I think finding maybe two or three levels to report at. So from a, a contract delivery point of view, from a construction contract, you will want, want a lot of detailed information that is not necessarily the full information that you want to give to your board and your CEO because it's too detailed. Um, so then you need a, a kind of separate level that, that talks about we are 10, 20 percent less than we were last year or whatever it is and, and things like that. We've, we've created you know, five or six jobs solely in the around the, the circularity, the sustainability, the circular economy space and things like that and know the level that you want to report at. Um, but certainly there, there are a lot of organisations out there to support and how you measure and monitor. And I think knowing what you want to measure and monitor is, is the first step in that, because if you understand that better, you'll find a tool out there to help you. Thank you so much, Stephen. I think, Jim, you have a comment on that? Yeah, just, just going back to the previous question that, that I was asked in terms of sustainability strategy and how do you convince your CEO that you need one? Um, Balfour BT. Uh, and as well as all the main construction uh, companies uh, across the whole of the UK, we insist that before you can step foot on any of our sites, that you have to be pre-qualified. And in order to be to, to achieve a pre-qualification level, that, that you need to have a sustainability strategy, and we need to see it and evidence it. So we, as part of our organisation, and I know for a fact that every main contractor out there in construction world um, also demands that there is a sustainability strategy that is present in your organization before you become approved supplier to to uh, Balfour BT. So big business will demand it because they need to prove that, that who they operate and they engage with has a sustainable strategy in their own business to ensure that we as a big business can drive those changes uh, through through uh, our, our, our company, our business, our, our operations. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, thank you so much, Jim. Um, on that note, I will just quickly read out a comment that we've had in the chat box uh, from Alan. He says, thank you very much for your great speakers. The example set on behalf of their own businesses has left me more optimistic about our future sustainability which is kind of the whole point of today that's why we're here to inspire and motivate so uh that's great to know thank you alan um and i think that's all we have time for today i'm conscious of time uh so i just wanted to bring up kind of my final slide for today before we go um if that's ready there we go Cool. So just kind of really quickly circling back to Zero Waste Scotland, I just wanted to end uh, by mentioning that we do provide support. As uh, Jim mentioned, uh, we have lots of tools on our website, expert knowledge um, that's available to Scottish businesses to kind of help them adopt new circular business practices. 
uh, or look at their current business models differently. Um, the Circular Economy Accelerator site is a really good place to start. Uh, we have plenty of case studies, inspiration, ideas, resources uh, to kind of get you started on your circular journey. And obviously, if you have any questions uh, that maybe come to mind after the end of the session, we're always available to help and support. So please do reach out. Thank you ever so much for joining us today. We will kind of finish here. Thank you so much for our speakers. Very inspiring session. Um, thanks everybody for your comments and thank you for hanging in there until half 11. And yeah, enjoy the rest of your day.